Well, this is another series in our modules on fractures in children, and this is we entitled ankle fractures in children. Is that the appropriate term we should use? Is that, you know, actually to be more accurate, does, does a joint really fracture? It dislocates. So it really, probably the better term is fractures of the region of the ankle in the skeleton immature. So really this is going to be limited to the fractures that occur on the proximal portion, which is the tibia and fibula. Fractures in, in the distal portion will be in a totally different um, when we talk about fractures of the foot. So I think it's important that we realize that this is really the, the fractures occur in the bones and the joints don't remain, by and large, don't remain dislocated. So here's an 11 year old male presents to the emergency room at 8 a.m having fallen from the tree. And this is the x-ray. He had a swollen elbow, you know, ankle on the left. And this is his x-ray. And here you can see a lateral of the x-ray. And so he was examined by the orthopedic resident on call. And his only injury involved this left ankle, which was swollen and tender. Now, he was examined by the resident on duty in the emergency room and she got her staff, Dr. John Smith, out of church. It occurred on Sunday morning. And so she looked at this x-ray and she described it to Dr. Smith. She said, Dr. Smith, I have an 11-year-old with a Salter Harris II fracture of the distal tibia and it's displaced laterally and the fibula has a distal shaft fracture. Well, Dr. Smith is not much impressed. He had to leave church, and he said to uh, the resident, well, doctor, that tells me nothing more than the structure of the physio pattern. And when you're talking about fractures about the ankle, especially the distal tibia and fibula, the Salter classification really is somewhat useless. Um, so you need to be a little bit more precise, and you need to tell me how this fracture is classified. So you need to get on it when you wasted enough time, too many words to tell me about the problem, and I gotta get back for the final prayer. You need to be a little bit more efficient when you take me out of a very interesting sermon. And the resident says, hmm, she got a clue that he's not very happy, and she needed to do a little bit more studying. So, We'll start here. How are should be fractures of the ankle region classified? What classification uh, do we use in the adults? What do you use? Do you use the Lodi Hansen yes, sir. and the Dennis Weber. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. And the child. What about the Salter Harris? If you look at the major textbooks, they kind of function. They kind of focus on the Salter Harris, but it as we'll see, it really isn't that useful. So what classification have we found to be the, have I found to be the most useful? It's just the um, pattern of the fracture. That's right, the displacement pattern. So, you know, we, we were really big on classifications. And what should a classification tell you? The pattern? The yeah, the structural pattern of the fracture. The treatment? Yes, right, very good. And finally? Complications. That's exactly right. Yeah, th that, those are the things that when you call me in the middle of the night and you tell me you have a certain type of fracture and you have it classified, then I know exactly these three things and I know what we need to do. So, what classification just does that? It's not tagged in. Well, that's right. Actually, it was done by really primarily by Dr. Luciano Diaz, who was working with Dr. Tajan in Chicago. And they realized that actually, in fractures of the distal tibia, remember when we talked about, you know, fractures in general in children, that the physis is weaker than the ligaments. And so, the failure occurs more in tendency in the physis, so there's very specific patterns of that. And so there's the components of it, there's four types. And we'll see which they are. Go ahead. What what type is this? That's um, supination or inversion. inversion yes, very yes, good. And what's this one? Uh, pronation. External inversion. rotation. That's right. 
<coughs> and as we'll see, when you call me and tell me that's a pronation external rotation, I know exactly what the pattern is and what we can do. So, where do you got this? Um, that's external rotation. That's right. This is an external rotation force. So it was in, the reason we say it's in supination is if you, when we talk about the foot, the foot in pronation is very flexible. So if they put a pressure there, actually the, 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 the uh, uh, force is pretty much dissipated in the foot. But if you have a supination, that's what it is when you push off, and so the f f foot is more rigid, and that's why it has more of a tendency to, to, to transfer the uh, force up to the ankle, up to the distal tibia. And finally, what's this one? Um, that's a, uh, a flexion? Uh, yeah, actually that's supin supination plantar yeah. flexion injury. And this also tells you the uh, mechanism of force, the degree of deformity, what direction it is. And as I've found in dealing with fractures in the pediatric age group, it's very useful. So, and these are the pediatric counterpart of what? The Loggy Hansen. That's exactly right. If you take the Loggy Hansen, the failures are different in the pediatric age group because the, the uh, fasces are weaker than the ligaments. So, let's go ahead and start and go through each type and we'll start with the supination inversion. There's really two stages in that. What's the, what's the first stage? The position of your foot prior well, to the... Yeah. yeah, the first stage is actually, it's a varus force that applies, supination varus force. And so the first thing to fail it's is the fibula. And a lot of times these are undisplaced fractures, but they're tender. And so when a child comes in and you think it's an ankle sprain, you probably need to consider that maybe this is an undisplaced fracture here that's failed not in the ligaments but in the physis. And what happens if that really fails? Oh, uh, then as you invert it, uh, uh, the, the pressure's um, transferred to the... Uh, medial side, yes, that's sir. right, very good. So as that becomes a complete fracture, then this actually produces a compressive force on this side and it's a push-off type of fracture. Now, so what's the overall deformity of this fracture? It's inverted? Yeah, it's in varus. It's got more of a varus angulation. That's right. So, in the stage one, what are the clinical findings? Maybe some pain. Yeah, mainly it's just... Lateral pain. Yeah, there's local tenderness over the fibular physis, not over the ligaments. Although a lot of times they will have a little pain over the ligaments too because they've been stretched but the failure occurs at the physis. So you'll have some local swelling right over the physis. And on the x-ray, acutely, all you do is see some deep soffit tissue over the physis, as you can see here. And then late, and this doesn't occur very often. I've not had a lot of experience uh, seeing this, but sometimes you'll see a little, if it's torn the periosteum, you'll see a little periosteal elevation. Okay, so this is, what is this comparable to in the adult? The uh, SCR1? Yeah, but... Or uh, not... Uh, well, it's just like, a, it's kind of the uh, pediatric ankle sprain. And so, you treat ankle sprains in adults? Yes, sir. Yeah. How do you <coughs> treat them? You put them in a short leg cast? Just huh. an air cast or... Why is that? What are for the... comfort? Comfort and what else? What Swelling. else do you need? Yeah, there's two things that you need to accomplish. One, you need to support, so it's painful. And two, you want to start mobility, because if you immobilize it without uh, allowing mobility, you'll end up with what? A stiff ankle. A stiff ankle and atrophy of the, of the muscles around it. So how can you ch achieve this? What do you use? What are you Phys using now? Adult? Physical therapy? Yeah, but what else? This is that doesn't give you much support initially. That will oh, help you. Um, well, you can use an air cast or an ankle splint, and the nice thing about the air cast or the splint, as the swelling goes down, you can tighten it up, and it, 
it does, along with the shoe, provides uh, really good stability, but yet it allows a little bit of motion that occurs. So even though it's a child, they, why don't you forget? You, you just mentioned it. They need to get, everybody says, children, you don't need to give them physical therapy because they'll get better on their own. That's not always the case. A lot of times they're immobilized and they're not using it, and then later on they'll start having some ankle pain and leg pain, and it's really fatigue pain because their muscles have become uh, atrophied from disuse. So you need to, that's why it's important that you do some rehabilitation. And in children, you don't always send them to the physical therapist. You do them, have them get on a bicycle, climb stairs, and so forth. Now, <clears throat> we do know that there's closure of the physis about the ankle. What's the last one to close? The fibula. That's exactly right. The fibula is last <coughs> to close. And here you can see the fibula is still open, but this is, still, this is closed completely. And we'll talk a little bit more about the pattern of closure of the distal tibia. But the fibula remains closed. So, how does this affect supination inversion injuries in this age group? Where do you get the failure if you have an inversion foot? At the fibula. That's exactly right. So, these you'll have isolated fibular physial injuries. And a lot of people just say, well, that's just a little simple fracture. You don't need to worry about it. But, what is the important about the tib Taylor joint? It's a very exacting joint, and any displacement is going to change the pressure areas on it, and they're not going to do well. So, what do you need to accomplish with that fracture? Stability of the ankle? Well, you need, yeah, provide stability, but before you do that, what do you have to do? Reestablish what you need to do. You provide stable fixation, yet you want to make sure that you have articular congruity. So, how can you accomplish that? Uh, well, a reduction, I mean, you... Uh, you do a reduction, and then how do you stabilize it? You can use a single, usually you can percutaneously just use a single screw, and then you can check the, uh, use an arthrogram to check the congruity, to see how congruity is. Now, this is a patient, has a 15-year-old, was seen at another outside facility, and he was a high-performance soccer player and had this fibular injury. And when he presented to the uh, physician, he had this. And you know, would you worry about, that's just a simple little fracture of the fibula. Would you worry about that? Yes, sir. You would? Okay. What would you do? Uh, I'd want to make sure the ankle was stable. And what else? You want to get the ankle joint back in congruity, right? Yes, sir. Well, they let him, they, did, they thought, well, you know, that's just a simple fracture. All he needs is an air cast and he'll be all right. Well, it isn't acceptable because it's still offset a little bit. And I saw him about six months later because he was a high performance soccer player. And when he started playing soccer, he had trouble because He's got this incongruity, he's got that little spur there. You can see the, and this was very symptomatic, and it required arthroscopic resection. So, <clears throat> there's another variant. What's happened here? The Did this follow the rules? Talus is dislocated. Yeah, so where's the failure here? At Does this the follow the rules? Ligaments. Yeah, you need to realize that. Most of the time the physis fails, but there are often rare, very rare occasions where the ligaments will fail. And so that's, you need to make a little bit differentiation because the treatment's a little bit different. So the, this is a valgus force, a varus force. So don't forget the ligaments can fail in the skeletal mature, although it's very rare. So what's the major complication with these injuries? Supination inversion, stage one. A uh, pain? Yeah, they get chronic weakness because they've been immobilized and they'll start getting some pain when they go back to activity because they've been immobilized, the, the uh, gastric soleus muscles and the anterior muscles are weak and when they start doing high performance activity, 
they'll fatigue very early. And so it contributes to this. Remember, they need to be rehabilitated, even though it's a pediatric patient. And we have a tendency to say, well, just don't worry about kids because they'll get better on their own. But that's not always true. But you do need to give them this. All right, so we've had enough about the stage one. If it completely fails, what happens? Where's the force transmitted? Through the medial mouth? That's right. Yeah, it's on the, this on the lateral side. We've got complete avulsion here. So we've lost all stability. And so the force of the inversion force here, the supination force, has been transferred to the medial side. And so wh what do you have there? What kind of force do you have here? Uh, compression? That's right. That's right. It's a, it's a compression. There's usually a salt of hair three or four fracture of the medial malleolus. And you uh, uh, said very adequately there's a compression force. This is a compression force that occurs here. So you need to understand it's a crushing type of injury. And so what's significant about that? It can lead to a growth arrest? Yeah, it can crush not only, there's two, uh, actually, there's actually two growth plates. There's a growth plate here, which is provides length, but there's also endochondral ossification right under the articular surface so it can actually this compressive force can crush both of these and we'll see some examples in a minute where that occurs so it's a crushing injury now if we look at uh, the thing to show you that it's a crushing injury here's a couple examples if you get a ct cut look at this you can see how it's kind of multi fracture because it's not just a single line but it's kind of been compressed and this is actually the fracture line right through the physis. So this is further evidence that this is a crushing injury. A number of years ago, I had this one, and you can see what's happened here. Articular surface is depressed? That's right, because it's a crushing injury. And when we opened it up, you can see, yes, indeed, it was. And so we had to reestablish the joint surface on this. So what's the stages of treatment? What, what do you have to do? Well, remember the two things about treatment of fractures? You have to uh, reduce the fracture, fracture and then stabilize. It. Yes. Yeah, you have to obtain and maintain. That's right. So how are you going to obtain? Uh, this would be a valgus. Uh, yeah, you, you're right. You reverse the, the forces. And so you get a satisfactory reduction. Well, would you, would you accept that? You can see this patient has, this is fiberglass. This patient had a reduction, had a fiberglass cast. Uh, is that okay? I want to say it looks okay, but the articular surface on the medial. Well, you could, you could do an arthrogram, but the articular surface is acceptable here. But you had to obtain, you've done that. What are you going to need to do next? Uh, this will maintain. maintain it. Yeah. yeah. So what's the problem with this fracture? Okay, it looked okay. Oh my lord, it came back uh, after it had healed and it may result in this. And we see this is four months post injury. Now, what's happened here? The deformities reoccurred. Oh. Well, actually, it has shifted. Yeah. And what, what kind of problems can you expect when it shifts like this? Uh, probably pain and then malalignment. And what else, as far as the structural part? Well, the pathology here is you got the joints are incongruity. So that's a real problem. What else? What else can occur? Arthritis. Well, you can get a bony bridge, and why? Because it's been in, it was injured and it's not uh, well, that's anatomically some, reduced. Yeah, if it's not anatomically reduced and it moves like this, the reason is. The epiphysis, uh, the bony surface of the fracture side of the epiphysis, is now aligned with the metaphysis. And when you have two bony surfaces together, what is it? What happens? It fuses, and so you get a actually a bridge of bone across that. So now allowing the two osseous fissures to unite, and that's one of the reasons you often get bone bridges with these because you get this force here. So you need to understand, even though you get an anatomic reduction, 
you have vertical shear forces that will allow late displacement. So, what are you going to do about that? What effect does this have on the stability of the fragments? Well, it has a tendency to, as we saw, migrate proximally. So what are you going to do to prevent that? Either K-wires? Yeah, okay. Even if you reduce it anatomically, you still have that. And you're going to put a trans pin? Probably. Or yeah. you could go through the physis if it's smooth. Yeah, if it's smooth. But you, you, the, the force here is actually a shear force in the sagittal plane. So, yes, yeah, so this will stabilize it, but it doesn't always help the healing. So what do you need to do to make that to heal a little bit better? What kind of force do you have to apply in your fixation? Compressive force. That's right. And how are you going to do that? Um. Well, nowadays, of course, with image intensifiers, we can put, you know, the pins are not really effective because you need a compressive force. Put a screw? Yeah, and so you put a screw across it because you can see it and do it with the image intensifier. And you can do this percutaneously, and this applies compression. So now you've looks like you've reduced it, but how are you going to check, make sure that it's the quality of the reduction? You can do an intraoperative uh, arthrogram. Okay, yeah. Or some people actually, yeah, you can do an arthrogram. You can do an intraoperative arthrogram, and if you look real closely, now you, you the proof that the joint surface is congruent. Some people will use an arthroscope to look at it, so you can do it either way. It's simpler actually. Uh, to do an arthrogram, and I find that that's, you can also get a dynamic of it, looking at it under the image intensifier and make sure that it's stable, you apply some stresses and so forth. So, the biggest problem with the supination inversion injury is what? The concern of the physis? Yeah, right, and so you get, you're going to get a physal arrest. So, when do you have them come back? Uh, regularly? Yeah, regularly. Yeah, you have them come back when you've determined that it's healed, and then when? Um, probably, probably about three months. You know, you need to have them come back. Um, and so, how are you going to determine the physis is recovered? Is that physis recovered? You probably need to see them as they grow. Uh, yeah, what else? But you can see that before that. How do you know it's growing? Well, there's you need no, to get a little there's bit There's no block. Yeah. No. What do you see here? Oh, what the do I, uh, uh, yeah, the Harris Park growth rest lines. And actually, if you look real closely, you can see it's, it's even done the same thing in the fibula. And there was probably a, a fracture here, and so there's, they see this. But this tells you, this is the beauty of the Harris Park growth rest lines. You can see that it's symmetrical. And if it's asymmetrical, then you'd be suspicious that you have a growth arrest. So, what about the fibula? Does it need to be fixed after you have stabilized the tibia? Uh, if you stress it and it's unstable. Yeah, but most of the time, that's the best thing to do, right? Well, you, just after you put the uh, screw in and have stabilized the tibia, you do stress and make sure, and I find at least in my experience, and I think it's the experience of others, once you stabilize the tibia, the fibula doesn't move, and you, rarely do you need any fixation for the fibula. But you do test it after the tibial fixation. And it's usually stable and requires no fixation, but if it's unstable, then you want to provide some kind of axillary. Well, now this fracture has the highest rate of complications. Why? Uh, because it's a vertical shear injury. That That's right. It's a, yeah, that and actually because it's a crushing injury. And so remember, it crushes the physis that you have here. And so this is not an uncommon outcome. This was done by one of my associates. This patient showed up. He had been treated at another facility and looked like a pretty good reduction. And so he was treated at a, by another physician and had him come back. And so you would, you would expect that that's okay. But why do you need to follow him up? Well, it's undisplaced. Uh-oh, what's happened? A uh, bony bridge is formed. Yeah. And here you can see that the Harris Park growth rest lines 
are asymmetrical. It's not growing here, but they're continuing to grow here. And so it's one year, he had a mature bridge formation, and he actually continued, he thought maybe he'd get better, continued to follow him, and he continued, and you can see there's a continued growth here on the lateral side, but no growth on the medial side. And you have this joint between the epiphysis and the metaphysis. So now he's got a pretty disabling deformity. So what's the pathology? What's happening medially? Medially he has the rest of growth. That's right, and, that, and that, what does that do laterally? You got asymmetrical Harris Park migration lines, and so it continues to grow on the lateral side, but not on the medial side. There's no Harris Park growth of rest lines here on the medial side. And you also, what do you have with the joint surface? You have a varus deformity. Yeah, varus ankle here. So it produces an angular deformity. All right, what's happening on the lateral side? Is it fibula, is it growing? It continues to grow. Yeah, so when it does, what does it do? Well, it actually kind of changes its structure there to conform with the angulation. So it continues to grow, and you can see you got fibular overgrowth, and it actually becomes a little crooked when you see that. So you get a secondary curvature. So here's the patient clinically. This actually came from an old textbook that was published in 1900. At that time, they didn't have photography, they drew pictures. And, but you can see here, the deformity, how's it gonna affect it? Oh, there's a limb, limb length discrepancy? Yeah, some. That doesn't seem to bother them some, but because there's not that much growth in the distal tibia. Well, what is the parents like? How, uh, the, what, what is, you know, this, this say this is a girl and she's very pretty and you know, they think she's going to be a dancer or a model and what are they concerned about? The way the right foot looks. Yeah, right. They're concerned about it. It's unsightly deformity. And that, that has really no bearing on the function. So what are the functional effects? Well, you know, it, it predisposes, they come in, they're complaining of constant lateral pain because they're putting stress forces on that. And the weight bearing is shifted laterally. If you look at the weight bearing in the normal side, it should go right down the center of the ankle. But if you have it here, the weight bearing is on the lateral side. And so when they have in uh, their stance phase, they have a uh, kind of a stretching effect on the lateral side and they get recurrent ankle sprains. So, this patient comes in, what are you gonna do about it? You remember, we've looked at it. So, first we deal with the lateral side. And what do you have to do with the lateral side? What are the? You can do an epiphysiodesis. That's right, you have to, first in the fibula, you have to stop that growth. And you're gonna change this angle. What do you have to do with the fibula to change the angle? An osteotomy? Yeah, you have to do some type of an osteotomy, a lateral closing wedge, or you can do a coronal oblique osteotomy, but you need to do something so that you can rotate the tibia. If you don't, it's gonna be very hard to rotate the tibia. So, now we've done the lateral side, we did the, the epistodesis and the osteotomy. Where, where are you gonna go next? The medial, medial side. side. Yeah, and so this is the so-called Gill Abbott technique that we talked about. It's been there around him. So the first step is what? An opening wedge. Yeah, you stem. can do an opening wedge. Some people will actually put a fixator, a ring fixator on it and do a gradual correction. But uh, it's been found that you can, in this area, if it's just minimal, you can do an acute correction. So you first thing you do an oblique osteotomy that's parallel to the uh, joint surface and then you open it up so that you now have it, the joint surface is now perpendicular to the long axis of the, the long axis of the tibia. And what you do is you find this angle and that tells you how much of a wedge you need to take. And once you put the wedge in, what do you have to do? Fill it with graft. Well, we did that. We filled it with graft and what else? Oh, um, 
Is that going to hold it? Maintain it with some kind of fixation. Fixation, right. You can use a cross pin through that, or you can stabilize it. We, in this case, use a, use a large staple to could do it, or you can put a plate on it, or you can actually use a, just a guide wire up through, I mean, a wire or a pin. So this patient was treated by the Gail Abbott technique. What's happened here? The bony bridge was not removed. Well, yeah, they, he, they, they actually closed it so it didn't grow anymore. And they accepted the shortening, and if you need to do it, you can go on the other side and do an epistodesis on the proximal portion, because you don't have much growth here. But there is a defect in the joint surface here. Why is that? Well, you remember there are two growth centers on the medial side. There's one here just under the joint surface, and the joint grows by endochondral ossification. And of course, we had the other bridge here, which they decided not to do anything. They just actually, the other thing is that you really need to close the lateral side. But this is due to the crushing injury. And I've seen that, and it doesn't appear to be a long-term problem. Um, there's some good studies out of Sweden, and they find that this doesn't really seem to problem. Um, uh, because actually the, the medial malleolus is at the same level here. You don't have any angulation. Well, now this patient comes in, and what's this fracture pattern? It's um, the uh, pronation external rotation. Right, yeah, pronation T external version. rotation. And, you know, this is why we need to uh, learn here. There are some other factors here that are going to dictate the treatment. So what's the pathology with this fracture? What kind of failure is it? What's the bony injury? Oh, uh, through the, uh, the physis. The yeah, but how did it fail? Was it by shear or by uh, invulsion or by twisting? On the medial side, it's part tension and, and the yeah, twisting. Yeah, that's right. It's a tension force that occurs, not a shear force. It's not a rotational force. It's a, it's a pure tension force. So it's an avulsion on fracture on the medial side, and, but there's a soft tissue element on this one. What's that soft tissue element? Periosteum. That's exactly right. Very good. Because remember, the periosteum is the thickest right at the pericondyl ring, and it's thinner proximally. And so when you get this much displacement, that will tear proximally. Okay, let's go to the lateral side. What's happened on the lateral That's side? That's a crush and also with ro rotational part. Uh, yeah, part yeah, actually this is a fracture here, but it's, where is it? Is it in the physis? Oh, no, sir. It's, uh, in, yeah, it's, it's in either the metaphysis or the diaphysis. And it can actually be up pretty high. So, it's usually a diaphyseal, it's either a green stick or sometimes you have to be very careful, it can just be plastic deformation. So, remember though, the beauty of this one is that we don't have to worry about articular incongruity because the articular surface is not affected. So, What's the overall deformity of this? The supination inversion was varus. What's this one? Valgus. Valgus. Very good. It's a valgus angulation. So, how can most of these be treated? Uh, operatively with uh, uh, fixation. Well, you always want to operate on all these? Well, th this one here, since we're the, we don't have to worry about the joint, all we need to do is just uh, reduce it you can do a closed reduction, and then you, when you do that, you always need to put a long leg cast on it um, with the knee in flexion so they're not walking on it. And if they're really unstable and a lot of swelling, you can actually do some cross, you know, here you can percutaneous. So here you can do your operation. But most of the time you can do that, do this. So you can use transmetaphyseal screws. Now, if it's a Salter Harris one, how do you stabilize it? We close, reduce it, and uh, cast it. Yeah, but you need these have a lot of swelling and so forth, and they have a tendency to recur. What are you going to do? You can do a, a pin. Okay, very good. What kind of pin would you put? Smooth. Yeah, and how are you going to put the pin to minimize the chance of growth arrest or the effects of growth arrest? Well, if you do that, 
you can put a smooth pin through the medium malleolus, but you try to get the smooth pin, the fixation right into the center, so if you get a bony bridge, you don't get an angular deformity, you just get some shortening that you can deal with with contralateral epistodesis, or you can take the bridge out or whatever is necessary, depending on what type of bridge and so and how old the patient is. So you aim for the center, if the, so if growth arrest occurs, it will be symmetrical. So there are some variants, you don't see this very often, where it fails in the medium malleolus. So, what's your treatment here? What's your treatment option here? Uh, fixation through that portion because it's part of the articular surface or? Well, yeah, you stay away from the articular surface, but you can put a smooth pin and then you put a tension band here. And if you do that, you, you can use absorbable suture. And this pin either it's very just prominent subcuticular or you actually can be outside and you can just pull that and move that and kind of thing. you can do that or their bone is pretty solid and you can actually use a real short screw and you can put it in with a short screw because their bone has good bony stock and you're going to put them in a cast anyway to keep them non-weight bearing so what's the instance of growth arrest with this type of fracture well, it's not very common, so it does occur, it's fairly rare because it's an avulsion injury, not a crushing injury. So if it do have growth arrest, how does it occur? Here's one that had this and got a growth arrest, and we'll look at it a little bit closer, and you have a central bridge, so the rest is usually symmetrical. Here's the arrest, and it usually is symmetrical, so it's a shortening because now you get fibular, the fibular will continue to overgrow, as you see here. And so you can either resect that bridge or you can do a, complete the epistodesis and do the epistodesis on the other side in the fibula, and then you do the epistodesis here, or if it's a long time, you may have to do an epistodesis proximally. So here we got a 12-year-old male playing soccer, what kind of injury are you suspicious of here? A concern for an open injury? N no, it's not quite, but it's almost. What, what's the position of the foot? It's in valgus. valgus. So this is what kind of injury do you think it might be? What, uh, this, yeah, the pronation, the, external that's rotation. Right. With it's that. in, you know, the foot's in pronation, external rotation. And here's the fracture x-ray. And so he was sedated in the emergency room, and that looks pretty good. They took an x-ray. Is that enough? What else do you need to get? You need to get a mortise view. You always need to get a mortise. You always need to get three views here. So that's the best reduction they were able to do in the emergency room. Do you have any questions or concerns about the, qu the, the quality of that reduction? It's not perfect. Well, I know it's not perfect. Where is the defect that you're worried about? Posterior lateral, that Thurston Holland. Well, pregnant. this, yeah, but why is that not perfect? Because there's periosteum. Very good, the yeah. Side. See, there's a little gap here, and that can be, you're concerned about that. There's a little gap. So, you take this patient to the operating room. You know, the, the senior resident says, well, you know, they're not very smart as a first and second year residents. Let me show you how to do it. So they do an exam under general anesthesia. They kind of repeat it. Is it any better? No, no, sir. No. This was the best alignment they were able to do with the second reduction. And they're still, you're still concerned yes, about it? And so, how are we going to solve this pathology? You got to open it. That's exactly right. And they, yeah, this one still has a gap there. And so we need to, this is the most common complication associated with this fracture. It's not growth arrest like with the supination inversion, but it's usually interposed periosteum. And you can also have interposed, most commonly, is periosteum, but there have been cases in which there are other soft tissue, posterior tibial nerve, or posterior tendon, or the artery. And I can tell you from experience, of some others, if you get that posterior tibial nerve is in there, 
they're pretty painful for a while. So if you have a lot of pain afterwards, you ought to be concerned about that. So here's one that, here's our patient. And you can see here, you have the distal uh, portion of the fracture service, and now they have pulled out that uh, periosteal flap. And so you just need to make a small incision to do that. Then you percutaneously pin it or put a screw or whatever is necessary. You have the interposed periosteum inhibiting the reduction. Now, sometimes that periosteum may be a little bit subtle. Here's the injury image. And there's a little suggestion right here. Is there some non-invasive technique that you can do to see what's going on? Uh, CT scan? Yeah, you can do a CT, but does that show soft tissues very well? No, an MRI. MRI, yeah. Yeah, see there's a little gap there, so there was some concern about it. So this gap, <clears throat> so the MRI has settled the issue, and of course with the MRI, you can see where the periosteum has actually been inverted in there. So it's a good way to do that if it's pretty subtle. All right, suppose it was treated elsewhere and they didn't recognize that the periosteum was interposed. What's going to happen? Uh, the what? growth will be affected. Yeah, in what respect? Huh? It'll overgrow? Yeah, it'll overgrow. If we're not a growth arrest, it'll overgrow. Very good. No, it doesn't. This is what happens. It, it continues to stimulate on the medial side, and there's really actually growth stimulation, and that can appear clinically with a pathological varus. And here's another example of one that overrests, and he was having symptoms, and he had a scar, and so I went ahead and did an osteotomy on him, just a closing wedge osteotomy, and took out that kind of interposed all that had become a scar when we took the wedge out. But if you leave the periosteum in there, it will cause it to go into valgus and overgrowth. And you can see it here. Now, <clears throat> the next one is the supination external rotation pattern. And what fails first? Well, it's the tibia that fails first on this. And it's usually an oblique spiral fracture that you see. And remember that the, the one thing that's unique about pediatric fractures is you don't really have much in the way of diastasis. Um, it's not until they become skeletally mature is that, that they begin to um, lose their diastasis and you have to put a diastasis screw in there. So you get a, rot a rotation here. And if you've got a little continued rotation, where's the next force applied? The fibula. That's exactly right. And it's a you have this oblique fracture, and then if they continue in the second stage, you'll have this second stage that occurs here, and you get an oblique type of fracture pattern, spiral distal fibular metaphysis. So you remember in the adults, usually the, the, the ligaments tear, and the force is applied to the fibula, and so the fibula usually fails first. But in the pediatric age group, it's different. The tibia fails first. And so the anterior tibial fibular ligament usually remains intact. Now, so the overall deformity of this fracture pattern is? Is uh, valgus uh, or, or rotation? Rotation more. It's a rotation kind of thing, external rotation. And so this patient came, was, we were called, uh, the resident was called to the emergency room and by the emergency room doctor and the resident immediately went and looked at the x-rays and he said, oh, he's got a distal fibular metaphyseal fracture. How can you get that? He had got an AP view. Does that look all right? Well, it's a little strange here. The fibular fracture was obvious, but to get a fracture of, or twisting of the fibula, what do you have to have? Failure of the tibia of some sort. Yeah, the tibia of some sort. And since Whether the ligaments usually remain intact, in the adults you can get an isolated fibular fracture because the ligaments tear and the rotational force is applied to the fibula. But you don't get a rotational force of the fibula until the tibia fails. So what about the tibia? Well, it looks a little suspicious here. So what's the next step? He went and looked at the x-rays and said, oh, 
That's no problem. You just got an isolated fibular fracture. What's the next step? I'd, I'd probably CT scan it. Is there anything that's more simple that you might do? Um, you could stress it. And what else is even more? That's going to be pretty painful. That's for true. Um, what else would you do? Get a third view of the, uh, the angle. Yeah. Well, there's something very basic. Why don't you examine oh. the patient? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And that tells you a lot. <laughs> Here's the patient when he's lying in the emergency room. And so this confirms that this is a pure rotation injury. And so the simple way to treat this was we put him to sleep and just distally rotated him. And he got the rotation back. Although there's still a little external rotation here. And you make sure that that's not in the, that's probably in the hip joint rather than in the ankle. But that's very important since it's a rotation injury. You need to make sure that you derotated it fully. So the message is you want to be aware of an isolated fibular metaphyseal fracture because for this to be applied, you've got to have some failure of the tibia. So here are the post-reduction and the comparison views will tell the story. Here's the post-reduction and this was the pre-reduction. Now you've got good uh, congruity of the distal physis and you don't have to worry about the fibula because this is all intact. Okay, <clears throat> now the salt of Harris fracture pattern, the tibia is now more apparent. So most of the fractures are treated and when you reduce it, how you do it? Reverse the mechanism, so yeah, if it's a supination. Yeah, internal, that's right. You internally rotate the distal fragment to close the fracture and there's another procedure you need to do. So when they externally rotate, they also have a tendency to kind of translocate a little bit posterior. So you need to sometimes when you do that rotation, you need to kind of bring it forward so that you bring it back and get it uh, correct the translocation in addition to the rotation. And if it's severely swollen or it's an uh, overweight child, and you can, don't hesitate, a lot of times they are Salter Harris II fractures and you have a big Thurston Holland fragment, so don't hesitate to, you got the patient asleep and you use percutaneous screws, put those screws in percutaneous. So the major complications here, they end up with an external rotation deformity due to incomplete correction. And you know, if you only have 30 degrees, that child when he walks, that foot's gonna be turned out and the parents are not gonna be very happy. And so, to, you know, even 30 degrees would be unacceptable. So you need to really check and make sure that you have the normal 15 degrees of thigh foot angle. And it's really rare, again, to get physeal arrest. Okay, now what fracture pattern do we have here? Supination plantar flexion. Yeah, that's right. And this is actually very similar to the pronation external rotation because it's an avulsion fracture. And sometimes they're kind of a combined. It's actually, it kind of displaces posterior lateral. And so the gap is sometimes anterior lateral. It's a combination of the two. And the components are, what are the components? Distally. The distraction at the distal yeah, tibia? Yeah, that's right. It's, a, it's an avulsion force. It's usually a salt of Harris one or two fracture and it's posteriorly translocated. And then the fibula, has anterior, apex anterior angulation as it occurs, a green stick fibula. So the overall deformity of this fracture pattern is? Uh, it'll be a external rotation flexion. Yeah, it's really a posterior translocation plus some flexion. So if you're gonna treat this one, how are you gonna reverse the mechanism? Are you gonna um, pull traction and then extend? That's right. extend. Is there another way to relax them? Gastroxylium. Bend the knee. Yeah, bend the knee and put the ankle in a little bit of plantar flexion. But you do a cast immobilization and reverse the deformity and the translocation. And so usually you bring the knee flexed with the heel forward while you kind of push on this. And if it's, again, if it's got a big fragment, it's a lot of swelling because a lot of times you put a good cast on and the swelling goes down it get light displacement. The other advantage of this is that they can start early motion, it's gonna be a stress. And you stress it and make sure, and you can put uh, percutaneous screws, transmetaphyseal screws. 
Now the complications here is you get interposed tissue just like the PER or an inaccurate reduction due to a green stick fibula or you, occasionally you can get growth or rest, but that's pretty rare. So there's, we now get into the adolescence and there's two special fractures that we see in adolescence. The telo and the triplane. That's right, yeah. That we see a juvenile telo, and this is the triplane. And the, actually, it's been on for a long time, but it wasn't until 1955 that there was already an article um, about this. So what are the three planes? The um, sagittal, yeah, coronal, well, and... They occur in the distal physis because that's why, why, that's why they occur in the adolescence. So the distal tibial physis, the closure is, is asymmetrical. Initially, it starts actually kind of in the center, a little bit of central medial, and then with time, you get complete closure of the medial side, but the lateral side remains open. And then the, it gradually preside, proceeds to the lateral side, and then finally you get complete closure. But this is the point in which it is most vulnerable. It's when you've got the medial closed, but the lateral is still open. And so, since the ligaments, the uh, anterior tib fib ligaments are on the distal fragment, and the physis is, is weaker, that's when you get the juvenile to low fracture, as you can get it like this. So, what kind of a ro motion produced this? External rotation. Yes, right. So it's pulled off by the anterior fib ligament. Here again, the ligament's stronger than the physis, as you can see it. So it's pulled off anterior. So the diagnostic pitfall is what? Well, sometimes if you just get AP, you can, this, this fragment can be kind of hidden and you can't see it on the lateral. So what do you always have to do? Get obliques? Yeah, oblique or mortis injury. So it's always important. Sometimes that fragment, you have to have a mortis view. Now, how can these fractures be managed? Can you put on a cast and put pressure over that fragment? Uh, because it involves articular surface. No, you need no to that's right. Production. You can't. You have to use, this is one that's kind of mandatory to stabilize. And a lot of times you can just put a screw across it and put compressive forces and that will close it down. You can do that percutaneously uh, if it's not rotated or so. And so you can put a screw across it. The complications here is just inadequate reduction or failure to recognize it. And it can, can technically produce later, uh, degenerative joint disease because you've got incongruity and or fail to recognize it as actually a part of a triplane. So we looked at the triplane and you told me there's three planes. Well, there's a vertical, which is in the sagittal view and that's usually through the epiphysis. There is a horizontal and that's through the physis and then there is a coronal and it's through the posterior lateral metaphysis. That occurs occasionally. It'll occur on the medial side, uh, the, meta the the coronal, but usually it's posterior lateral. Now there is a clue here that this is a, you know, you don't have a lot of displacement of this suspected triplane, so you think, well, that's not too bad. But what is it? There's a clue here that this was markedly displaced. Is it the widening on the medial? Well, yeah, a little bit, but. There's a bony clue. Okay, remember when we say, what do you have to do to get a fibular fracture? You have to have an injury to the tibia. Yeah, and you gotta have a lot of displacement. So this one here probably had a lot of displacement and then spontaneously corrected to some degree. But when you have a fibula, then you realize you had a lot more displacement. You can see this. So there's significant displacement of the fibula. So. How do you make the diagnosis? Is this a telo? Or is it a triplane? What do you need? More x-rays? Yeah, like what? A lateral and a mortis. Yeah. yeah. This you can see the AP. And you got CT reconstruction. And this gives you the clue it's a triplane. You need a good lateral and that shows you have the, the vertical coronal fragment here. 
the CT reconstruction. And so, of course, that confirms it's a triplane fracture. And here's one, you can see it as well in the injury films. And there's a central medial that is fused. So, what's the treatment of this? Well, you can do a reduction and percutaneous pin fixation. Usually, there's a lot of swelling because it takes a lot of force to do this, especially if the fibula is intact. So what information do you need before you decide how to put the pins or screws in? Uh, you need to know the fracture pattern and also how the articular surface looks. Yeah, and how are you going to determine that? A CT scan? Yeah, CT. You really need to, they're almost mandatory. And there was a good article that showed that CT scan doesn't really change your treatment. You, you decide you're going to put screws, but it does give you a little clue of where to put the screws. So. You can tell from the x-ray, all you can tell is that you got that, uh, the central medial physis that's fused, and if you look at the lateral, you got this. So this tells you you got a triplane fracture, and you're going to need screws, and you can do it percutaneously if it's fresh, but you need to know how to put the screws. And so, uh, you can see this. So you confirmed that it's a triplane fracture, but the other information you wanted to get is that we want to see the alignment of the fractured planes. And here you can see it. And look at here. So it's not truly a talo, which was just anterior lateral. This was all fused. Uh, this was all fused here, but it failed right through here. And so this fracture line is actually got two big fragments, and it's had an external rotation force into two fragments. And the plane is actually in the sagittal plane, you know, like this. That's in the epiphysis. And we go up to the metaphysis, where's the plane going to be? In the coronal. That's right. It's going to be in the coronal plane. So that tells you how are you going to need to place your screws. So <clears throat> the fracture plane here is in the coronal plane. So how are you going to reduce this? Uh, you'll need to um, internally, internally rotate. rotate. Yeah. Is there a, a good way to get good leverage on that? You can use joysticks. Yeah, you can put a, a guide pin here and another guide pin here, and then you can use that to close your fracture site, and you can kind of confirm that with an arthrogram. And once you get closed, then you can take one of those big pins and pass it across, and then um, pass the other one across to kind of stabilize it and then replace this with a guide wire and put a compressive screw on it. So what, how are you going to put your pins? So here, you know, because we had the CT, we put the pins in the coronal plane. And so on the metastasis, where are you going to put the pins? What plane? It's going to go from A to P. That's right. So it's going to be in the sagittal plane. But the same manip manipulation when you do it in the epiphysis, remember these pins are in the epiphysis, when you rotate them, that's going to close that, and so your pins have to be in this position. And you, can, you usually do an over drill, or you can use compressive, partially threaded compressive screws to do that. And so this is the final result, you know, you had the in the lateral side, you have the two screws in the metaphyseal fragment in the sagittal plane, and then in the coronal plane, you have the screw that goes across that was replaced there. And then you got the screws across, you got a good reduction, and then finally, you do an arthrogram to check the congruity. And most of the time, if you catch them fresh, you can do this uh, closed. If not, don't hesitate to make a little incision. The problem is, a lot of times you have to make a posterior lateral incision, so it's kind of deep down in there. So, post-operative protocol, what are you going to do? Allow him to go back to football the next day? No, sir. I think uh, since you operatively fixed it, range of motion, you can start motion in the ankle. Yeah, you can. You can put them in an air cast, and you check it for, you know. So that's the beauty. You can get fixation. But they want to get out and play basketball and football. When can they bear weight? Oh, they've got a wait a period of time. What do you mean a period of time? Um, 
four to six weeks? Well, what other factors will tell you that it's, it's pretty stable? Well, you mobilize them in a cast if you do a closed reduction alone, or you, the splint, if it's stabilized internally, and you can start a motion, like you say. And they're usually they're non-weight-bearing for three weeks, and you can do weight-bearing with support. They can have an air cast, and they can begin to bear weight once you see callus formation. And then, of course, you follow the x-rays, confirm continued growth. Do you need to worry about growth arrest in a triplane fracture? Yes. What caused the triplane fracture to begin with? You had growth cessation, so you really don't. You know, you, you worry about loss of fixation and so forth, but you don't have. They're at the. They're usually at the termination of your growth. So you know, and that's the reason they had a triplane because they are actually have normal growth arrest. And so, I want to see if you learned anything from the textbook. So here's our resident. And after doing study, this resident again contacts this Dr. Smith from the emergency room, and she says, Dr. Smith, I have an 11-year-old with a pronation, eversion, external rotation injury to his ankle. And Dr. Smith says, great. Doctor, it's because of your precise prescription. I know exactly what this patient needs. See if you can get an adequate reduction by closed methods but be sure you don't have interposed pump periosteum. And the patient, the resident says, sure pays to have studied. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.